and thank you for asking me to fill in those rather big shoes. I will do my best. I've been had a couple of days to think about what I might do. Uh, and the topic, as you will see, is very different from what you might have expected. But uh, however, I think it's very much in the spirit of the pit code lectures, uh, I issues of uh, interlanguage, language development, error analysis, and so on, will are still present in what I'm going to talk about today. So what I'm going to focus on is the rather vexed issue of formalicity in language in general, but is specifically in second language learning. So what do we mean by when we talk about formulaic sequences? What role do they play in uh, language development? Uh, how can we conceptualize them, identify them, uh, and then I will give a few examples uh, at the end of, of studies that have looked at these things. The reason I wanted to talk about this is because there are quite a lot of misconceptions in the literature and people calling the same thing actually quite different constructs. So the um, uh, I will start by talking conceptualization and definitions. I will talk about issues in identifying formulaic sequences. How do we know that something is formulaic in a learner production? I will then present a new methodology for identifying psycholinguistic formulaic sequences, and I'll say exactly what I mean by that uh, a little bit later. And I'll give examples from two studies, one at the very beginning of the second language acquisition process and one uh, in advanced, very advanced learners, if I have time, because I know time is a bit short. So first, conceptualization and definitions. So as some of you who are familiar with the field will know, there are a variety of approaches and terminology. So in terms of approaches, uh, there are formal linguistic approaches. People will look at formalicity in expressions that don't follow the typical uh, language rules. So an expression like by and large, which would not be uh, pro produced productively using uh, the grammar of English. Uh, there are corpus linguistic approaches, which have adopt a very different approach. So they look at what is frequent in samples of language. So things like salt and pepper, coke, uh, uh, regularly more often than we would expect. Uh, pragmatic approaches. So why do we say things in certain ways? So nice weather today rather than uh, the weather is beautiful or, or, or something like this. And psycholinguistic, so that would be more things that we say so often that we produce them without having to put them together online. Uh, they're, just, they're just a unit of meaning, uh, even though they might uh, contain more than one morpheme. So uh, there is some uh, overlap, of course. Uh, but uh, we will talk about that more. I think they, some of those constructs are quite different. In terms of term terminology, according to Ray 2002, there are over 40 terms. Just a few examples there you'll have come across. Uh, prefabs, chunks, uh, formulae sequences, formulas, clusters, converse, conventional expressions, collocations, idiomatic expressions, many more. So the, depending on what field you work from, you'll be more familiar with some of those uh, than others. So this is all rather confusing. Do those terms all actually mean the same thing or not? Some terms are linked with specific approaches. So for example, clusters or engrams, uh, they're often called now, are used more in corpus linguistics. Chunks, or uh, are used more in psycholinguistics, so this idea of chunking. Uh, many of those terms are inter interchangeable, most but not all. And in 2012, Ray said formally sequences is now used as an umbrella term with a multiplicity of meanings. And what I want to show is that that's actually rather problematic to use just one term 
especially in the context of second language acquisition. So what are the different meanings? I think there are two main approaches to the study of formalicity in, in language. Uh, according to Ray 2008, we can talk about a speaker ex external definition. So by that we mean what is formulaic in the language outside the speaker, so in the language the speaker is exposed to. So for example, because of formal properties, so there are many irregular uh, semantic or syntactic uh, expressions such as by and large, by the way, and so on, which we would not uh, put together online. Uh, it's also what's frequent in, in corpora, so things like having said that, by the way, so, so things that are frequent that we say all the time, and also uh, things, ways of saying things in certain communities, and those formulae are also very frequent. So why do we say, will you marry me, rather than would you like to get married, or whatever else we might think about. So you can all think of such expressions which uh, have a pragmatic function, it's the way we've communities have conventionalized uh, uh, e e expressions. So that's the speaker external definition. What is kind of formulaic in the language learners are exposed to? The speaker internal uh, definition, on the other hand, uh, sees formulaic sequences as psycholinguistic units for a given speaker, and that's the focus of my uh, presentation today. So either because they are stored holistically, they've never been stored in any other way, they've been learned in that way, so something like kick the bucket, for example, is not made up of kick the bucket, it's just one expression with one meaning, or because they have been automatized so efficiently that they're retrieved with greater efficiency than other linguistic strings. So things we say so often, we retrieved as one unit, one unit of semantic meaning, um, and we don't really, they're, they're processed faster uh, than other units. Uh, so is there an overlap between speaker internal uh, definitions and speaker external definitions. Uh, of course, there is often an overlap. What is very frequent, what is formulaic in the language uh, we are exposed to, is more likely to be processed holistically and more e efficiently, uh, but not uh, necessarily. Uh, and I'll give you some examples. So, the reason I want to suggest that there are two distinct constructs is that, um, for example, some idiomatic expressions or clusters which are commonly found in corpora are not necessarily stored holistically or preferentially in all native speakers, so we all have our own set of formulaic expressions, and never mind L2 learners who in the process of uh, acquiring a second language and certainly might not have automatized these expressions yet. So if we take a not so common idiom such as the straw that broke the camel's back, it might be formulaic, it might be one unit in many of your um, um, idiolects, but not all of you. Um, conversely, some speakers store some sequences holistically which are not particularly frequent, nor shared, shared by other speakers. And we'll all be familiar with that with some people's uh, mannerisms in speech. So people who might say, don't get me wrong every two seconds, or, or, or things, um, uh, fillers that we might use, and that vary from person to person. So there are actually some, uh, some things that are highly formulaic in, in some of our peers that we never ever use, so they're not necessarily processed holistically or retrieved faster in our own speech. Uh, 
So now I want to examine in a bit more detail each of these constructs in turn and, and then draw out the implications for learning and for uh, second language acquisition. So I won't talk too much about speaker external approaches to formalicity uh, for a range of reasons, partly because they've been studied a lot more. So most of the second language acquisition literature on formalicity is about that type of formalicity and my interest is more in the psycholinguistic definition. But uh, one thing that is very, very frequent in the literature is that formulaic sequences that have been defined speaker externally, so that are formulaic uh, in the language around the speaker, are actually assumed to have psycholinguistic reality. And it's clear to me from my own research that they very often do not. They're not a whole unit. They're not processed holistically or faster necessarily in second language learners. And I'll, I'll give you examples of that. So in an L2 context where uh, learners are still developing their um, uh, vocabulary, their set of uh, phrases and so on, uh, it takes a long time to automatize sequences and they might not have reached that stage yet. Uh, so key notions in a speaker external definition is, is really words that have a strong relationship with each other, a relationship that we might not expect on the basis of the frequency of each of those words separately. So either because corpus linguistics shows that they co-occur with high frequency, or they form a syntactic or semantic whole. So um, pull someone's leg, or by and large, or, or so on. But also an important notion in that uh, construct is the uh, notion of restricted ex exchangeability. Uh, so for example, in, uh, in uh, formulaic sequences, uh, you usually cannot replace one member, one morpheme in that sequence by another homonymous morpheme. So if I say I'm afraid I have bad news, you can't replace I'm afraid with another expression that means uh, the same or very similar thing. So you can't say I'm scared I have bad news or I'm frightened I have bad news. It just doesn't work. So it shows it's kind of the conventionalized way of speaking that we've all, we're all familiar with. So what is then the psycholinguistic status of speaker external effects? So the, these formulaic sequences have been defined speaker externally. What status do they have in the mind of, um, of language users? Most of the studies, as I've said, in second language learning adopt this learner external approach. So they investigate how learners learn to use idioms, idiomatic expression, uh, collocations, and so on. So that's the vast majority of the literature is in this area. But many of researchers then assume that these idiomatic strings have psycholinguistic reality. But what is the evidence? So in terms, just a few studies, representative of the field as a whole, Underwood et al. Uh, found that both native speakers and second language learners processed these idioms and collocations faster than non-formally sequences. So things like kick the bucket versus kick the ball. Um, but many of the studies have found that only native speakers uh, have uh, such an advantage. So for example, Sierra Vochantra, Klin and Schmidt, 2011. Not all idioms are known to a second language learners, so it might be a quantitative rather than qualitative difference, but I'll say more about that later. Um, so common idiomatic expressions, because those that we might expect a learners uh, have been exposed to quite extensively and might have incorporated into their idiolect, uh, where the object of a study, so they're more likely to have been automatized, to have been, to be processed more holistically uh, than say the straw that broke the camel's back, for example. Um, so Yang and 
Uh, Necrosova found a processing advantage for those common idioms uh, for both native speakers and second language learners. But Schmidt et al, uh, who tested holistic processing, found that even among native speakers, not all uh, formulae sequences are stored holistically. And second language learners in their study only stored a small minority of these sequences uh, holistically. So what can we conclude from this rather messy evidence? Um, sort of most of the corpus derived formulae sequences present a processing advantage for native speakers, but it's unclear if this processing advantage is shared by second language learners, even at ad advanced levels. Most of these studies are on very advanced learners. And even corpus derived formulae sequences are not always holistically stored even by native speakers. And that's quite easy to understand if we think we all have our own idiosyncratic formula lect, although, of course, we share many formulae sequences as well. So the psycholinguistic status of these speaker external formulae sequences remains rather unclear, and especially in uh, second language learners. So I'm now going to talk about psycholinguistic speaker external formulae sequences. So the definition given by Ray 2002, which is widely used in the literature and actually is used also by people using a speaker external definition when it's, as I argue, in, I think it's a very different construct, is a sequence continuous or discontinuous of words or other elements which is or appears to be prefabricated, that is, stored and retrieved whole from memory at the time of use, rather than being subject to generation or analysis by the language grammar. So, this definition, how can we operationalize it? This, uh, that definition is almost imp impossible to uh, operationalize in a study. So, and she stresses it's a conceptual uh, definition rather than an operational definition. But what is crucial in a definition is that idea of holistic storage, which is very common uh, in, in the literature. But then she also talks about discontinuity. Uh, formulae sequence can be discontinuous. How, ca how can something which is discontinuous be stored holistically? And how do you test if something is stored holistically? And that's what, um, uh, what, what I will move to try to do now. So the definition uh, I use in this paper is a definition we came up with uh, one of my PhD students a couple of years ago um, to try to operationalize how we might identify and test uh, formalicity in advanced learners. So we defined a uh, formalic sequence as a multi-word semantic functional unit that presents a processing advantage for a given speaker either because it is stored whole in their lexicon or because it is highly automatized. Uh, and and the, the main reason for doing that is that actually you can't really test whether something is stored holistically or whether it's highly automatized because the result, the end result is the same, that it's, uh, it comes out automatically. It's, uh, we, it, it's retrieved extremely fast and efficiently. So, psycholinguistic uh, formulae sequences have been the object of much attention in early language acquisition, in both first language acquisition, it's been extensively studied as a process and there is a consensus that children do store and use complex strings before mastering their internal makeup. So very young children, two-year-olds might say, what's that? And they don't know it's made up of what? is that, and they'll only be able to use those terms independently uh, much later. 
And it's pretty much the same in early L2 acquisition in both naturalistic and instructed contexts. So there have been many studies uh, showing that, that. And you'll all know if you go to a foreign country, you will might learn a few set phrases to ask uh, for a beer, to ask where the station is, and you won't know what word is what, you just learn that as a whole. And that happens a lot as some kind of entry into communication in both first and second language acquisition. In uh, advanced learners, there are very few studies, and we know very little. Most studies, as I've said, have adopted a speaker external approach because it's much easier to study. So my question here is how can we investigate the processing advantage, if any, of formulaic sequences defined psycholinguistically, so to, to storage in the mind, uh, in advanced uh, second language learners. And before I move to the identification, I will conclude briefly this first part um, by saying what is formulaic in the language is not necessarily formulaic in the mind of individual speakers, and we need to keep that in mind. And this is particularly true in the context of second language learners who have not completed the, automat the automatization process, and also where the input is less rich and more variable, so they might not have been exposed to as wide a range of formulaic sequences. And we actually suggest in the article I mentioned uh, earlier, two different terms should be used to make the difference rather than use an umbrella term which uh, ends up meaning rather little to show that we're dealing with these different constructs. So we suggest that linguistic clusters for externally defined formulaic sequences and processing units for psycholinguistic formulaic sequences, because that's what they are. They're units of meaning that are processed either very fast or holistically. And we define linguistic clusters as uh, multimorphemic clusters, which are either semantically or syntactically irregular or whose frequent co-occurrence gives them a privileged status in a given language as a conventional way of expressing something. So something that's formulaic in the language out there. And processing units we defined as a multi-word semantic functional unit that presents a processing advantage for a given speaker, either because it is stored wholly in their lexicon or because it is highly automatized. And this, the dichotomy between those two constructs is particularly obvious in the second language uh, context. So I will now move to how do we identify psycholinguistic formulaic sequences or these processing units. In L1 acquisition and early L2 acquisition, it's quite easy because there's a gap between learners very simple and often very faulty productive utterances in the early stages and their seemingly grammatically sophisticated non-analyzed formulaic production. So I give you an example um, here that it's from one of my studies for quite a, uh, from quite a while ago where during the same task the same learner produced both after a, one year of, of classroom French, quel âge as-tu, which is a complex syntactic expression uh, with WH front in, verb subject in, inversion, uh, meaning, so it was a task uh, with a researcher where they had to, to ask questions about uh, people in, in photos, and the intended meaning was how old is your brother, so that was, you know, clear in the context. So that was clearly a chunk, something they'd learned, okay, when you want to know somebody's age, you say, quel âge as-tu? And no understanding yet of what the individual morphemes in that expression are. And the same learner in the same task, a bit later, uh, said, il âge frère, literally, he aged brother, with the intended meaning, how old is his brother? <laughs> 
So you can see there the difference between the productive, the, you know, what the common grammar of the learner uh, uh, leads to in terms of production of uh, a very basic utterance, and then this seemingly highly sophisticated uh, chunk. So in early stages, learners tend to produce these um, formulaic sequences because they don't yet have the productive grammar to put them together themselves. That will develop in time. In advanced learners, it's much more difficult because there is no such discrepancy between the productive grammar of the learners and complex formulaic sequences. They would be perfectly able to produce them correctly given their current grammar. What we can investigate is preferential processing, so we can compare how learners process those sequences compared to other bits of language. But that does not necessarily mean holistic storage, it just means a processing advantage, really. So if I turn very briefly to Ray's diagnostic approach, she aims to capture all types of formalicity, formal, pragmatic, statistical, psycholinguistics, and she uses 11 criteria uh, ranging from um, grammatical ir ir irregularity, things like if I were you, lack of semantic transparency, kick the bucket, a specific pragmatic function, happy birthday, an idiosyncratic use, so, for example, the overuse of don't get me wrong, I mentioned earlier. Specific, specific phonological characteristics, you're joking with specific inton, intonation contour, so that has takes a very specific meaning. Inappropriate use, excuse me when you, I am sorry, would have been appropriate. Unusual sophistication, what time is it in a context where time might be more appropriate? and a performative function, I pronounce you man and wife, again, a conventionalized expression. But there's a problem with this approach when trying to identify psycholinguistics FS, because it will lead to both over and under identification. For example, kick the bucket clearly fulfills the semantic irregularity criterion, but if you have a second language learner who vaguely remembers that they've heard that expression and is putting it together uh, is it hesitantly online, so he's say, saying, uh, oh, kick uh, the uh, bucket, then it's not a processing unit. It's they're putting it together online. So it goes against a definition of what is formulaicity. On the other hand, there are many regular and transparent expressions that we use all the time. For example, I don't know, what's your name, which are likely to be processing units for a second language learner because they've you learned them in that way and because they use them a lot. But rare criteria would not ad identify them. So, um, these heterogeneous criteria identify very different types of FS, some learner external and some learner internal, but many will not have any psycholinguistic reality in the context of second language learning. And Ray is well aware of this issue, uh, but I had not proposed any solution. So I want now to turn to how we can identify psycholinguistic formulaic sequences in advanced second language learners. So, we would like to suggest we need to use a hierarchical approach. So, you need to apply some criteria first that are necessary. If a string does not meet those criteria, it cannot be formulaic from a psycholinguistic perspective. Uh, and others are, are, um, that are optional, uh, and I will go through these now. So, for example, unusual complexity or inappropriate use might be more appropriate to a first or second language acquisition. And I'll give examples of that. So, for example, you have learners, even at advanced level, that might say, in the bus instead of on the bus. 
For example, French learners of English do that a lot because that's the way you would say it in French. And it has become automatized and they produce it very fast and very efficiently, but it's not the correct expression. But some criteria need to be met. So for something to be, for phonic sequences to be psychology, psycholinguistically real, it needs to have phonological coherence because anything that stores holistically or that is highly automatic uh, cannot contain any pauses. It just cannot then, you don't pause in the middle of words. And in, in a sense, uh, uh, psycholinguistic definition says it's a string that has the status of a word. It's retrieved as a whole. So even a highly idiomatic expression like it's raining cats and dogs, if a learner produces it hesitantly, it's not a formulaic sequence. So this hierarchical approach is uh, necessary. And it's been mentioned before, even a long time ado ago, as early as 93, following suggestion in 83 already by Jackendorf, but it's not really been uh, picked up by the field. They suggested a preference rule system with necessary conditions that have to be met and graded conditions that help to secure the judgment. And typi typicality conditions, which usually apply, but not always. So no subset of rules is both necessary and sufficient because the necessary conditions themselves are alone too unselective. So they, they, you would allow too many things that don't really fulfill the definition that I mentioned earlier. So uh, Hickey's first condition is that it's an utterance of at least two more films long. That's a different definition of a sequence, so nothing uh, very interesting there. But the second condition which is necessary is phonological coherence. So the fact that phonologically it's one unit. And then he proposes uh, other conditions um, which some are similar to Ray's, others are slightly different. Um, and remember that's in the context of L1 acquisition, which is most, of, I mean, most of Ray's work is on native uh, productions. Uh, so individual elements of an utterance not used co concurrently in the same form separately. So things that learners produce uh, together, but never individually. And certainly in the work I've done, that's very common that some morphemes only occur in certain set expressions and nowhere else. So showing that they haven't yet been uh, analyzed to be used productively in the language of learners. Uh, grammatical sophistication compared to standard utterances. So that's the example I gave you earlier, quel âge as tu versus il âge frère. Uh, a community-wide formula occur occurring frequently in the parent speech. So that's the same, you know, the, the idea of conventionalized expressions and so on. Idiosyncratic, used repeatedly in the same form. Uh, situationally dependent, so when in a certain situation, that's what is always said, but also used in, inappropriately, which is quite common in the second language context. So then, uh, and uh, Hickey already argues necessary criteria need to be applied first, and these will depend on what type of uh, formulaic sequence you investigate. So in our study, we use a slightly different, um, in our studies, a different operationalization. So remember the definition as a multi-word unit that has a semantic functional unity and that presents a processing advantage. So ease of processing is a crucial uh, definition. It is really the necessary uh, condition. So phonological coherence needs to be measured by using external temporal and phonetic characteristics of uh, the, the sequences uh, we're looking at. Um, so this phonological coherence, which is necessary, implies fluent pronunciation, so pronunciation without any pauses. Long, um, and I'll show how you, we operationalize that in a little while. 
and other characteristics, so intonation, phonetic reductions, accelerations of the articulation rate, are all used as reinforcing factors. But fluent uh, pronunciation is essential, it needs to be there. And they need to have a holistic quality um, as well, either formal, so in, by and large, that would be a formal holistic quality, it's, it doesn't exist uh, in its individual morphemes, or semantic, so it's raining cats and dogs, or kick the bucket, or functional, uh, will you marry me, and so on. Um, because not all fluent runs in speech will display unity, and that might not, um, and that, that's important, that, that semantic unity, that unity is important. So you find irregular sequences with semantic unity, such as it's raining cats and dogs, but regular sequences with functional unity as well. So things like last year, I think that uh, expressions we use all the time. And also sequences learned as a whole by uh, classroom learners, by, for example, in routines and so on. And I'll come back to that at the end if I have got time. So the identification criteria uh, are the necessary criteria that you need to apply first on your data set, and that's a fluent pronunciation of a multi-word sequence. So no filled or unfilled pause longer than 0.2 seconds, no internal syllable len lengthening, no repetition of retracing. Additionally, there may be phonetic reductions, liaison, acceleration of the articulation rate, and so on. And it's all things that you can measure quite easily nowadays. And then the necessary additional presence of at least one typical criterion showing the unity of the, se of the sequence. So that's what I've just mentioned. Either semantic, uh, holistic forming in mapping, uh, likely present in the teaching context. And it's only after, so once you've I isolated the sequences that fulfill those criteria, that you apply other criteria that might strengthen uh, your identification um, uh, process. So for example, learner internal frequency, if a learner that, that goes with the the idea of this formal dialect, the idiolect of each learner. So some learners like we all do in any language, we use certain expressions all the time. But also learn an external frequency. So, for example, something that's used a lot in classrooms and then obviously comes out in, what, in the productions of the learners. So I, I won't spend time on... Uh, so that, that's just a file annotated for identification using Pratt, which is... Uh, and sort of by measuring pauses and so on, you identify uh, units that might be uh, fulfill those criteria. So in, um, in, in this particular instance, pour moi c'est important, was a fluent run, and then you identify sequences uh, within that. So the significance of this um, hierarchical approach uh, in the corpus that my PhD student Caroline Cordier had put together, which was a large corpus of advanced learners of French who were tested before through a huge battery of uh, spoken activities, and at the end of a year abroad, so they were actually still abroad as part of their university course. And the results showed very conclusively that many processing units would have been missed by using traditional criteria, and also that non-processing units would have been included. For example, there were many processing units that were grammatically regular, and those tend to be excluded by traditional criteria. And the idiomatic expressions uh, were actually a very small minority, but um, there were halting attempts at using idiomatic expressions that would have been excluded, that would have been included by a traditional approach, but that were clearly not formulaic for those learners. And in that study, learners use processing units very extensively, 
but their nature was very different from conventional idiomatic expressions. So there were many incorrect processing units, for example, sur les nouvelles, uh, meaning on the news, so a direct translation of English, when in fact in French we would say aux infos, aux informations. So, but the interesting finding is that using this de definition, uh, we found that uh, there were lots of formulaic sequences in these learners. Uh, nearly the 27.8% of the language used by these advanced learners were processing units. So they, it represented a big part of their language when in fact the, all the literature on advanced learners using the speaker external definition finds very little use of um, formulaic sequences, but that's because they're talking about a different uh, construct. So to finish, I just want to talk very briefly about the role of formalicity at different stages of development, uh, having defined formalicity in this, uh, in this way. So I will sort of talk, but just give basically a summary of the findings from two studies, uh, well, from three studies, one on beginner learners, so very beginners and post-beginners. So those are two very big studies. One is longitudinal over two years with 60 learners. One is uh, cross-sectional. Um, and uh, we did a lot of work identifying and analyzing formulaic sequences in those uh, data sets. And then the study for my PhD student, which is a um, in, in depth study of five learners with a huge amount of data per learner, so which enabled her to follow very closely their development in terms of formalicity before a year abroad and then uh, towards the end of the year abroad. Um, so the, fair, the, the, the early studies, what did we find about formalicity in the beginning stages of language development? We found that all learners use formalic sequences, so chunks that they learn as one chunk in the class. But some learners were much better at memorizing them. So we had some learners who retained a lot of them and others not. And the learners who um, had the largest store of formulaic sequences actually kept using them. So they did not discard them, they did not get rid of them. But there were also the learners who were the most active at working on them to use their constituent parts elsewhere. So they were unpacking them, they were taking bits of them, say the, um, the, the subject pronoun or, or, uh, and using it elsewhere. And these um, formulaic sequences in these early learners give them an entry into communication when their productive grammars are not yet able to, to let them say very much. So they're using them, if you want, as communicative crutches to, uh, so for example, expression like, what's your name, how old are you, they would use as one unit in context where they needed to ask what's his age or what's, uh, uh, so uh, ne never changing them, but it gave them some entry into communication. And it also provided them with uh, samples of language which acted as models for constructing their grammar. And we saw some learners doing that quite extensively in the data. In advanced learners, formulaic sequences are also very important. They do not disappear as the grammar becomes sophisticated and as their lexical diversity increases but they just become varied and sophisticated like the rest of the language uh, the learners are developing. So we found in, in that study I mentioned before that the use of formulaic sequences and lexical diversity correlate. So learners who use the most FS were also the most lexically diverse. So they, uh, and they were the ones that improved most 
most on both counts, so pre and post year abroad. We also found that the use of formulaic sequences and fluency uh, correlate. So the more learners use formulaic sequences, the more fluent they are overall. And we also found interestingly that these advanced learners who went through the British education system still rely on the formulaic sequences we'd identified in the early learner studies that they'd learn in classrooms. So those things were still clearly formulaic even in very uh, advanced learners. So at both ends of the continuum, formulaic sequences are used to facilitate speech production, but in different ways. Early learners use them as communicative crutches and as models for hypothesis forming and testing. But advanced learners use them as processing shortcuts and to buy planning time. They also use them to free up their attentional resources to pay attention to novel aspects of the language they're learning. So in the learners in, uh, in uh, Caroline Cordier's study, uh, who progress the most on all counts, they actually use those, you could see them using those sequences to give them time to think about what they were going to, uh, to say yes, uh, to, to say next. So to conclude, this term, formulaic sequences, is used with a multiplicity of meaning. So speaker external versus speaker external definitions are the two broad, very broad, the, the very broad distinction. And the two meanings tell us very different things about the status of formulaic sequences in learners' minds. And this is especially true in second language learning for whom the learning and automatization process is not complete and who may have automatized their own idiosyncratic uh, sequences. To have psycholinguistic validity, a formulaic sequences must show a processing advantage compared to other sequences. It must be pronounced fluently, it must show unity, and frequency can only be used as an additional criteria. So it is essential to adopt a hierarchical identification method. But it's an important uh, area to study because uh, formulaic sequences play an important role at all stages of second language development. But their role changes with the growth of the learner's productive competence. Thank you. So it's not going to say thank you and um, risk of producing a series of formulae. <laughs> and I'd really like to thank Florence very, very much for a fascinating and insightful talk. And I think this is a formula, isn't it, to take away lots of food for thought. I'm worried about what I'm saying now. Thank you ever so much. I really do appreciate that very, very much indeed. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.